Good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Philippe Sayeg. I am director for January in France. I am delighted to be here this morning to kick off the second day of API Day. So thank you for coming so early. I hope everybody is caffeined up and ready to go. So my mission this morning is to share with you how brands and customers actually um, drive customer acquisitions through social login APIs. So the name of the game this morning is to try to flip the switch and have a look at the benefits of API from a brand and end, cus and end customer um, um, perspective. So just a quick show of hands. Who in this room has already heard of or knows about Janrain? Not bad, okay, cool. So I'm just gonna do a refresh on uh, who we are. So basically, you know, yeah. Be, uh, we are an identity management platform. We're API based and our job basically resides in the identity management space and the social CRM space. What we do starts the moment anybody registers into an application, a website, or an iPad app. And when that happens, we do four things. First and foremost, we capture and we manage the identity of that individual. We then help the brand to build a social intelligence repository that allows them to do social data analysis on their customers. And last and not least, we help them build an engagement strategy using the data they collect. Now how that works, is through an API platform. So we have um, a collection of APIs that we package in a platform on the cloud. And we basically deliver three main uh, functionalities. One is social login and registration. The second is single sign-on. And the third is a social sharing widget to be able to push back to the web the content that any user has consulted on the brand's website. Now, everything and anything that goes through that platform is stored in a database in the cloud, and we collect demographics, psychographics, behavioral, behavioral data that we then serve back to the brand for them to do a couple of things, one being customer insights, and the second, integrating that data into other third-party applications through APIs, thus improving segmentation, personalization, and targeting. So what is the case for social login? Um, I can tell you, well, actually, we're in a cinema here. We're in a theater. So I thought that probably the best thing for me to do would share a video with you for two minutes. So here we go. The social web is everywhere, and people use it for everything, from buying to browsing to connecting on all kinds of devices. And as they move across the web, they share more and more information about themselves. And yet, when they arrive at your website, you have no idea who they are. Meet Anne and Jim. They are both ready to interact on a new website. Because they're new, they have no name, gender, or age. Demographic? What demographic? The cat could have walked across the keyboard. You don't know until they create an account. So let's watch Jim sign in. Most sites require a username and password combination to set up an account, and have a long list of required fields like a full name, birth date, email address, all of which have to be verified and confirmed. This process is less than ideal. Over 86% of people admit to leaving a site rather than registering. Jim is no different. In fact, he's frustrated in leaving now. This is a problem for Jim and for you. Meanwhile, Anne was offered social login and chose a social identity in order to accelerate account creation. And now she's in. Anne is able to engage with your brand throughout your site. In fact, she's making a product review for a purchase she just made. She's already connected your site to her social profile, so she can easily share that product review with her friends. As a trusted source, her friends and family are far more likely to click on her post and visit your site to see what she liked. This is just the beginning of improving her experience. You see, her social profile contains a wealth of data that she gave you permission to view when she first signed in. This can go beyond her basic information. You learn that Anne loves cooking, skydiving, running, and what movies and music she likes. With all this data, you can turbocharge your marketing efforts. You know that Anne likes shoes and she's an avid runner. We make it easy for you to pair that data with our world-class partners, including product or content recommendations and email marketing. So, while Anne is busy enjoying the personalized experience on your site that has been enabled by her social profile, she's happy. You're happy. She's on her way to becoming a valuable brand advocate. 
77% of people prefer social blogging. Give them the experience they're asking for and the data you need. Acquire. Understand. Engage. January. Et voilà. So I hope this was a good um, wake up for everybody in the room so far. Um, so this is what January does, and um, we've been doing this since uh, 2005. We're a privately held company. We've co-founded the OpenID Consortium, and our technology powers today 250,000 websites and about 2,000 brands. Now, the case of this website is not about selling you January. It's about telling you two things. First is that APIs have been around for a long time. So we've been doing this since 2005. Other people have been doing it for a long time. The main difference today is the scale with which APIs are taking on the market. The second piece of information is that everything that I'm going to be sharing with you right now <clears throat> until the next 20 minutes is already out there. So it's a fruit of eight years of experience, learning curve, error and trial. And the rest, of my, the rest of my presentation is going to basically be built around three pieces of conversation. The first one is about <laughs> the value and the benefit of aggregating APIs. The second one is about the value and benefit of having a standard interoperable API ecosystem. And the third conversation is about the value of data and API integration. So let's go. The case of social login today, we know it all. We have all have way too much user passwords and um, IDs to remember. So uh, if you look at the millennials today, our stats, so if you're interested by this kind of stats, we have a very cool um, stat board uh, that you can consult. Seven, seven passwords per millennial today. If you look at the, some reports, 92% of people report leaving a website, actually, as soon as they realize that they forgot their username and password. So that's a problem. That's a problem for everyone. And despite the fact that 77% of the people like social login today, they also want choice. So we've been tracking the way people use the social login APIs for the last three years. And I pulled out the Q3 2012 social login preferences. And as you can see, Facebook represents 54%, but you also have Google, Yahoo, Twitter, Microsoft, and LinkedIn. Now, this evolves in a very interesting fashion because you have 4% out there where you have new APIs that are coming on the market. Obviously, the size of the cake grew, but um, Google's uh, interest as well has grown. So there is a, a, a clear dynamic today on the use of, of, of APIs. Now, if we hold for a second and look back at the history of this API eco ecosystem, everything started in 2005 with the creation of OpenID. So libraries and frameworks were created. Yahoo, Google, and IOL adopted it. Then OAuth came on board with LinkedIn, Twitter, and Yahoo. And we're with Coop Open uh, ID uh, Connect today. And not only do people want choice, but they're in a situation today where you have a tremendous amount of choice. You have a tremendous amount of social networks out there and IDPs. <clears throat> so there is value today in aggregating these different social login APIs into one single abstraction layer that you can serve the customers to and the brands where they can come and actually benefit from all the experience and the connectivity that that provides. So why would they do that? If we look at, if you speak to Whole Foods, Whole Foods will tell you that social login APIs allows them to acquire customers in a faster manner. It's an acquisition process that allows them to bring people on board much quicker. And they do so by allowing them to eliminate all the pain of having to fill out registration forms. So they auto-populate it. And they have seen their conversion rates basically increase by 50%, which is a pretty impressive uh, result. But not only do they do that, using social login, they also decided to acquire and uh, benefit from the social profiles that customers actually give them the permission to have. So basically, when you're using a Facebook login, or a Twitter login, or a Gmail login, or a LinkedIn login, you're asked at that specific point in time if you're happy to share the information of your social profile. And when you do so, that data is transferred to the brand, and then the brand will use it to be able to customize and make the experience much more user-friendly. 
Now for Whole Foods, that translates into a lot of benefits. From, an, from a retailer perspective, cart conversion, customer intelligence, worth of mouth marketing, et cetera, et cetera, are very interesting values and benefits they derive. And they do so by leveraging the, the API, social, uh, the social login API, sorry. Now the case of the social API benefit is even more powerful on a mobile phone or a mobile device. I don't know if anybody has already tried to type in your first name, last name, address on a mobile phone. It's a pretty painful experience. In the case of social login APIs, this provides you with the capacity to access that application very quickly. And if you're a retailer on mobile and you're selling on mobile, it allows you to accelerate your checkout process, which is tremendous. There are companies out there that do billions of dollars on mobile phones. Universal is another interesting case. I love the company because A, I love music, they have very cool artists, but they also do very, very cool stuff with social login. Now, Universal's case is the following. They have labels. Each label has about 50, anywhere between 50 and 100 artists, and their problem was that they had one website per artist, and each website has been developed by the friend of the girlfriend of the cousin of the bass player who has his own agency out there. Uh, so non-structured, not very structured, they had problems collecting their fan information. So Universal told those various agencies, okay, guys, you do whatever you want, but your registration uh, process, you're going to use the same API layer and the same API platform in order for us to be able to collect that data from, in a, from a central fashion. So the first benefit for Universal was the capacity to be able to collect their fan information. But what was also interesting is Universal wanted to know is Philippe registered to the Lady Gaga website and then all of a sudden I wanted to move to the Justin Bieber website. A, I didn't have to register again, so there was a single sign-on process. And B, Universal knew that I was a fan of Lady Gaga and Justin Bieber. Therefore, they could cross-sell singles, they could cross-sell um, concert tickets, and so on. So, very cool example. Now, yesterday, for those of you who were here, there were a lot of conversations about how your services on the web tomorrow will be an aggregation of third-party APIs. So your website, in essence, tomorrow might become the sum of third-party APIs. So if we take that trend and transpose it in the authentication world, if tomorrow your website is indeed a collection of third-party APIs, each of which requiring authentication and registration, it might be a painful experience for your end user to go from one API to another. So wouldn't it be cool if all those APIs kind of had the capacity to be able to transfer that identity and authentication from one API to the other in the context of the same website? The answer is obviously yes. And for those who know that, there's something called the backplane protocol out there. Now the backplane protocol is a single sign-on process between different APIs serving the same website or the same web page. So the way this works is that you register on a website, your identity is then transferred into a discrete channel, a bus, and then transferred to that second API that is also backplane powered or backplane compliant, and therefore you don't have to register again on the second API. So this provides the end customer with a seamless experience cross API on the same website. So there are a lot of companies today that are joining on this protocol. So Janrain uh, being one of them, but you also have Livefire for commenting, Badgeville for gamification, and all the other cool companies that you have on the, on the, on the slide over there. So from a conceptual standpoint, this is really nice. But the real question is, so what? So that's OK, great. So APIs are talking to each other. So how does that translate to into real life? Look at Marvel. If you go on the Marvel website today, you have the capacity to register or not. But if you don't and you try to comment on, say, Thor, The Dark World, and you really like that movie, you need to register on the commenting it because the commenting functionality is a third-party API, which is Livefire. 
Now, in the case of Marvel, they took a backplane powered registration platform and live fire, combining both. Therefore, once you register into Marvel, you don't have to reaccess the different APIs. If I, uh, you probably had this experience, you've been browsing a media website and you decided to comment on an article or a blog or whatever, and all of a sudden somebody asks you to register. Well, this would be avoided if everybody was back plane on that, on that web page, if it makes any sense. So let's take this conversation one step further. We've talked about aggregation. We've talked about communication. Let's talk about data integration. Social logins allow you today to collect a wealth of information on your customers with their permission. So if I take the example of Facebook, as you know, a social login would allow you to collect you know, friends lists, demographics, interests. And when you have a player that is an API aggregator, they will provide you with tools to be able to configure these APIs. So in the case of Facebook here, for instance, basically it would be a tick box. You're going to be, you're going to be choosing the different attributes that you want to pull out of that social website on your customers. Now once you do that, it's also important through APIs to normalize and structure that data in a well-built database. Once you do that, the other thing you can do is you can push this a little bit further, take that data and integrate it into third-party applications that could be CRM, e-commerce, um, commenting, um, social media marketing, personalization, etc. This again, from a technical prowess, is fantastic. The real question is, okay, so what do I do once I've done that? So if I pick out some examples, I look at Channel 4, media company, obviously, it's in the UK. Channel 4 uses social login to accelerate the acquisition of their viewers, but they also do the following. Every time a viewer registers, his data is pushed into the email marketing system to be able to provide better segmentation and better targeted emailing campaigns. If you look at what Sears is doing today, well, when Roger logs onto the Sears website with his Facebook profile, Sears is gonna know that Roger loves the English patient. So when, when Roger is gonna be coming to Sears for the first time or the second time, well, Sears is gonna push on his homepage the relevant products and provide him with the capacity to be able to buy what he really likes. Now you can push this a little bit further should Roger accept to share his friends lists with Sears? And should Sears identify the number of friends of Roger who are already Sears customers, and they have, for instance, and Sears might have their birthdays, Sears may be able to push an email to Roger saying, hey Roger, Tim, your friend, is also a Sears customer. His birthday is coming up in a week, and by the way, he likes Lady Gaga, why don't you offer him her latest single? This is how far you can go. Coca-Cola does a lot of cool things. I love the company, they have a great content strategy and they have a great engagement strategy and that goes through personalization and therefore understanding your customer. So they use social profile data to be able to push targeted ads, but what they also do is they've rolled out this Coke Rewards loyalty program and they've embedded it in Facebook, and that program requiring registration <coughs> when connecting, sorry, there you go, when connecting, when connecting with um, that program, you actually transfer your social profile from Facebook to Coke, and that's how Coca-Cola uh, captures the identity of their Facebook fans. Samsung is another example. Samsung's issue was to define and identify the brand advocates. So Samsung's equation was simple, but at least it had the merit of existing. Samsung said, any customer registered through my website and any customer, so registering through the website of Samsung and liking the Samsung Facebook page equals brand advocate. And Samsung then decided to address that segment in a very specific fashion. Now I'm sure that Samsung also decided to figure out of Samsung customers, which ones also like the Apple page or the Nokia page, for instance, and address that segment differently. 
Now, social APIs and identification and authentication are only, the social logins are only IDPs, IDPs amongst many others. Pfizer, a pharmaceutical company, has today a legal obligation to only expose its content to known to doctors. So if you're not a doctor, you cannot legally access the Pfizer data or the Pfizer content. So what Pfizer did is, I don't know if any of you have friends who are doctors here in France, but there's an, an, a company called Cegedim, and Cegedim provides uh, doctors with a unique identifier. It's like the social security number of a doctor. So Pfizer today allows um, doctors to register to their website with Cegedim identifications. And therefore, Pfizer will know if Philippe is a doctor and Philippe has the right identification number, that I have the right to access their content. Now, take this example and expand it. Um, if you're a media company, say you're the Financial Times, and you decide that you want to provide specific access to, say, Ford, you may want to decide that, well, what I want to do is I want to give Ford employees the capacity to register to my Financial Times website with my Ford identification. And when I do that, I will be accessing specific premium content around automotive. If you are a broadcasting company and you struck a deal with an ISV or a telco company, and you want to provide them with specific content, so you have a part of your catalog that you're exposing to a limited number of partners in a B2B space, then you may want to think about creating an IDP that allows the login into an extranet and that has been, that's managed by potentially you or a third party. So this is how far you can go with identity. And since we're talking about B2B, Deloitte is another interesting example because Deloitte's interest regarding content was to be able to capture the LinkedIn profile of their uh, members. The reason for that is twofold. A, they wanted to, to measure or to recognize the seniority of the person registering, if you're a VP, a manager, a project manager, a student, etc. But they also wanted to capture the industry you were in to be able to push you the adequate content. Now, let's hold back and reflect on everything I've just said. And I'm gonna try to, tr to summarize the value that's been derived by these social login APIs from two standpoints. One, the standpoint of the brand or the website, and two, the standpoint of the end user. So, if I loop back to my initial conversations, API aggregation benefits today the websites by providing them with less maintenance. Basically, what they do they outsource the problem to people who are specialized in what they do. From um, a, a customer standpoint, it provides him with more choice, more login potential, and faster access to services. If you look at the API ecosystem, and I'm referring back to Backplane, you have less integration for the website, and you have better customer experience at the end of the day. And from a data integration standpoint, the benefit for the brand is obviously a better knowledge of their customers, but at the same time, the trade-off for somebody sharing that information is that the end customer will hopefully, if things are well done, benefit from a relevant and personalized service. So, what does this mean, generally speaking? If we move out of the authentication world and the social login APIs, and we reflect and put this in the context of this conference here today, what does this mean? Well, what is very obvious is that there is today an API shift happening. So APIs have been and will be increasingly opening new doors to ways to build new services, new technology, and provide customer experience. So from a technology standpoint, <coughs> you have seen and you will see companies moving from building and coding to actually aggregating and assembling APIs from an organizational standpoint, and this is probably the mammoth and the hugest hurdle to the expansion of this type of agility as flexibility, it's a cultural thing. And talk to any Fortune 500 company, you will know, they know about silos. And the idea is to basically expand the conversation outside the silos, and it's a human thing, it's an organizational thing that requires a lot of change management. 
from a standards standpoint, everything needs to become very interoperable because we will all become interdependent. So this has obviously pros and cons. But more importantly, from an offer standpoint, the technology issue or the choice is going to be moved away. And with everything being you know, the Internet of Things and everybody being connected, the customer is going to become, again, and normally at the center of all conversations. And companies are going to be moving from delivering products to thinking about what type of customer experience do I want to provide my customers? How do I make sure they come back to my service? How do I make sure that they're loyal? How do I make sure that they're happy? And how do I make sure that actually that value is shared appropriately between me, my API ecosystem providers, and the end customers? So today, if you're a company, and we all are, with a need for speed, with the imperative of being competitive with the imperative of getting there on the market very, very quickly. The probably one of the good things you like to think about is to keep doing what you do best and API the rest. Thank you very much. Thank you, Philippe. I don't know if you, do we have, how are we on time? Yes, we have time for one question. Good, so. Um, Question? Thank you. Um, you, you. You commented the interest of, of the brand and the interest of the, um, of the consumer to use social login. Yes. Could you uh, provide us with a couple of comments on the interest of the social network to do it? Uh, to provide... As, as in like the social, like uh, Facebook or... Gmail? Yeah, the model behind. Well, I, well my, my, that's a personal take on that. Uh, I think that the use of, of uh, social logins will promote the use of, of networks and uh, will promote the use of Facebook and Twitter. And I think that um, there will be a time where, well, there is a time today where uh, in the social login area, for instance, uh, Twitter, a Facebook, a Gmail, a Yahoo cannot afford not to be there because everybody's there. So the benefit for them is to drive traffic and to drive the brand. Then the, the difference here, and, 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 and this is a very interesting uh, perspective, uh, thanks to your question, is the fact that what I'm talking about here, we are in the space of the brand. So we're not in the context of a social network. So a Facebook, uh, Twitter will have its own DMP, will have its own way of understanding what their customers are doing inside Facebook and inside Twitter. The, 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 the social login piece that I'm mentioning here, all the APIs actually are in the context of the brand. So it's basically leveraging what's happening in the social network in the context of the brand. So there's no, I don't think there's a conflict of interest if, if probably the, the anybody is wondering, but I hope that answer, does that answer your question? Thank you. Any other questions? Okay, so I'm around all morning. Um, ah, sorry, there's a question over there. Okay, so uh, everything that is collected in the space that I've just described is permission-based. So uh, I don't know if you remember the Whole Foods, Whole Foods example, but before actually giving you access to the Whole Foods service through, say, your Facebook or your Gmail account, um, the, the, the application will ask you, well, will warn you basically that um, by doing that, you accept to share this piece of information, this piece of information, and this piece of information. So it's not it's not happening behind anybody's back. If that's if that's clear. Yeah. So the the key thing though is that there's um, th there is no adapt adaptation per se, as in. 
um, we don't own the data we collect, so the data is, is owned by the brand, so it's the brand's responsibility to make sure that they're compliant with just a transit, with just a transit piece. We can, we can store, uh, but basically the data belongs to the, to the, to the brand. We don't have any uh, <coughs> objective or you know, becoming a, like a global DMP or whatever, it's, that's not the case, it's uh, totally different. Any other questions? <clears throat> well, thank you very much for your attention.